The Association of American Medical Colleges and the Federation of American Societies for Experimental Biology, known as FASIB, are pleased to welcome you to today's webinar, The Integration of the Humanities and Arts with Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine in Higher Education, Branches of the Same Tree. My name is Sandy, and it's my pleasure to be the facilitator for today's event. I'd like to formally welcome the participants who are joining us today. Please note that today's call is being recorded and will be available online in three to five business days. All participant lines will be muted during this broadcast. If you experience technical difficulties with the web portion of today's program, please email aamc at compartners.com or send a message in the chat box. If you are listening to the program over the phone and you need assistance at any time, please press star zero and an operator will assist you. This presentation will last up to 60 minutes and will include question and answer opportunities during the webinar and at the end. You may submit a question at any time by typing into the chat box at the lower left corner of the screen and clicking on the send button. I'd like to direct your attention to the links box on the left side of the screen where resources are located for you to view, save, or print. Simply click on the link and a separate web browser window will open. This will not interfere with your viewing of the program. It's now my pleasure to introduce our hosts. AAMC and FASIB have partnered to launch a monthly webinar series to discuss the major findings, recommendations, and implementation strategies from five reports from the National Academy of Sciences. Good afternoon. Thank you for the introduction, Sandy. Uh, my name is Amanda Field, and I am a science policy specialist at AANC. I work in the Scientific Affairs Unit here, in which my team and I focus on improving and communicating research and research training policy issues that affect our member academic medical institutions. Hi, and I am Teresa Ramirez, the Diversity and Inclusion Policy and Outreach Specialist at the Office of Public Affairs at FACED. These two organizations bring you this webinar series on several National Academies 2018 reports that are relevant to the biomedical community, which you see pictured here, including their upcoming webinar on the sexual harassment report. The goal of the series is to not only relay the key findings and recommendations of the reports, but to provide the community with a chance to interact and discuss their concerns over and efforts to implement these recommendations at their own institutions. For this webinar, we will be focusing on the report, The Integration of the Humanities and Arts with Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine in Higher Education, which elaborates on benefits of the proposed integrative model of learning, which bridges the knowledge, modes of inquiry, and pedagogies from multiple disciplines within the context of a single course or program of study. Today, study director Dr. Ashley Baer will be summarizing the key findings of the report, and then the presentation will focus on the implementation of integrative curricula and how faculty, administrators, and accrediting bodies can explore, identify, and mitigate constraints that hinder integrative efforts in higher education. This webinar will also feature speakers from Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine and from Willesley College who will discuss integration at their own institutions. As Sandy mentioned, there is an open chat box that participa participants can use to communicate with us and with each other. So please do not hesitate to enter your thoughts or any comments throughout the webinar, including any work being done at your institution or organization. And now I'd like to introduce Dr. Ashley Baer, Senior Program Officer for the National Academies of Sciences Committee on Women in Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine and Study Director for this report. Thank you so much for the kind introduction and, um, and really a big thanks to FASA and AAMC for taking on this series of webinars. Um, it's really a value for us to not only raise awareness of the outcomes of these National Academy studies, but also to hear from, from all of you uh, about how we can think about implementing, implementing the findings and recommendations from, from the studies. We, we don't want these reports to sit on a shelf. We want them to help uh, drive and advise action in higher education. So I'll just begin by offering a very high-level overview of the report's key takeaways. But I'll just start by saying that everyone should read the report. I, I was reviewing the report in preparation for this webinar, and I, and I was reminded about how much rich material there is in the report. And so I'm really only going to give you a glimpse into um, the committee, committee's deep thinking on this issue. Um, but so to begin, maybe I can um, provide 
some context for why we took on this particular study. So in addition to working for the National Academy's Committee on Women in Science, Engineering, and Medicine, I also work for the Board on Higher Education and Workforce at the National Academies. And the Board on Higher Education and Workforce, the, the work of this board is motivated by a question, and that question is, what does it mean to be motivated, or sorry, <laughs> what does it mean to be educated, but motivated is part of it, uh, in the 21st century? And so in the context of this board's work, we think about educational practices going on um, on campuses and how they, they may be meeting the needs of students today. And, and this particular study was inspired by the fact that we see on college campuses today and in medical centers a movement towards a greater intentional integration of the arts and humanities with science, engineering, and medicine, um, an intentional integration that's driven in part by the sense among many in higher education that higher ed is too siloed these days, that we've, we've gone too far in terms of um, separating di the disciplinary knowledge, skills, and pedagogies from each other. Um, so the first step in our, our work to take on this topic and examine um, the impact of these kinds of programs in higher education on students uh, was to assemble a fantastic committee of scholars and experts to, to lead the work. As a study director, I can serve as a spokesperson for um, for this project, but really the, the true the true experts um, that wrote with this report are the committee members. And so this committee was comprised of um, scholars from the arts, humanities, sciences, engineering, and medicine, as well as people who have worked uh, at the integration of these disciplines. We had people who um, could speak to this, the value of integrative uh, learning from Higher ed, the higher ed perspective, both as faculty and administrators, as well as people in industry who could speak to the impact of integrative education on um, providing graduates with the skills uh, and knowledge they need to be successful in a 21st century innovation environment. And we were we were so lucky to have the best chair that we could ever have asked for for the study, um, Dr. David Scorton who is currently serving as a secretary of the Smithsonian Institution, but I'm very happy for AAMC that he will be coming and joining them as their CEO in July. Um, you could, really couldn't have a better, a better leader for your organization. I, I, I am so grateful to Dr. Scorton for leading this study. Um, the report itself took about two years. Uh, the committee, considering the available evidence in the published literature, meeting with um, with scholars and experts and faculty members and students in higher ed to hear their input on this. We released a Dear Colleague letter to ask for your input um, and assembled all the available evidence to, to take a hard look at the impact of these kinds of programs on students. Um, and so in a moment, I'll give you the high-level key takeaways from the report. But before doing so, I have to pause and take a moment to thank the sponsors for this study. Nothing we do at the National Academies would be possible without the sponsorship of other organizations. Um, and in this case, we, we were lucky to have the generous support of the Andrew Mellon Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts, the National Endowment for the Humanities. And, and actually, in fact, um, this is unusual, but the, this report we thought was so important that the National Academies itself kicked in a little bit of support to, um, to make the study possible. So now if we could go to the next slide. I want to spend just a moment um, talking about the title for the report. Um, so the, the piece of the, the title that comes after the colon, Branches from the Same Tree, we really like to talk about that as the real title for the report because we think it gets to the, really to the heart of what this is all about. And, and so Branches from the Same Tree is a quote that's taken from an, from, um, an Albert Einstein quote. And I, I, I just want to say that it, we thought it was so fitting um, to tie Einstein to this project because in many ways, Einstein is the patron saint of the National Academies. Um, this sculpture here it sits outside of our National Academies building. Um, it's a humongous sculpture that if you haven't visited, you should. You can take pictures and sit on Einstein's lap. And, and so we have great respect for Einstein at the National Academies as a scientist, but also as just a thinker. And Einstein himself was a great proponent of the integration of the, the arts, humanities, sciences, engineering, and medicine, and he's famously quoted as saying that all religions, arts, and sciences are branches from the same tree. So this is the uh, this was the inspiration for that that portion of the title, and I think it does get to the heart of um, of what this project was about. So now now to get to the so sort of key takeaways um, from the report, um, and again I encourage you if if 
this is at all interesting to you to read the full report. It's, it's available for free for download, and there's a lot more information there than I'm going to cover right now. But um, but among the key outcomes that we found in the report, when we when we examine the available evidence um, on the impact of integrative uh, courses and programs on students, we found some really interesting learning outcomes uh, among students. So when we look, at, for instance, at um, at the available evidence on um, in undergraduate education and the kinds of um, learning outcomes we see among students in these kinds of courses and programs. We found among, among the um, positive learning outcomes are written and oral communication skills, improved teamwork skills, ethical decision making, critical thinking, and the ability to apply knowledge in real world settings. Um, I should say just for a moment that the way that this committee considered integrative education really goes beyond just a, a liberal arts education in which students take a, you know, a philosophy course over here and an engineering course over there. These, um, these kinds of courses and programs are very intentionally integrated so that within the context of a particular course or program of study, um, students are exposed to I the ideas and toolkits of different disciplines at, at the same time in the context of, um, of addressing a problem. Um, or, or understanding uh, a phenomenon, and so, um, so we thought these were were very like very positive and striking uh, learning outcomes, and uh, interestingly, we found that these same learning outcomes we see associated with undergraduate integrative uh, courses and programs align very well with what we hear both we hear from from higher education institutions. We look across the diverse landscape of um, institutions in higher education. Uh, each institution is doing doing something different, but but many many institutions come together to say there are certain learning outcomes we want all students to graduate um, in possession of, and these include these very same sorts of set, uh, cross cutting skills and knowledge, written and oral communication skills, teamwork skills, ethical decision making, critical thinking, applying knowledge in real world settings. Also, very interestingly, these same kinds of cross cutting skills are what we find employers are also asking for in graduates. We in the report cover um, an array of different survey um, surveys from employers, and in which there's this consistent message that yes, the technical skills are important, especially in the STEM fields, but it's not enough. What we're what employers feel are lacking are these these cross-cutting skills and knowledge. We also, of course, looked at the specific outcomes associated with integrating the arts and humanities in medical training, um, which, as it turns out, is actually fairly common practice. Um, in many ways, medical uh, schools are, are leading the charge on this. And we also found some very striking, um, powerful, positive uh, learning outcomes associated with this integration. So increased empathy, resilience, teamwork, improved visual diagnostic skills, actually improved technical skills, increased tolerance for ambiguity, and increased interest in communication skills. Um, I know I'm running short on time, so I, I'll, I'll just, but there'll be time for Q&A and we'll have more time together to discuss. But I, I wanted to pull out a few key report recommendations the committee made. There are many other recommendations, but I would say as the committee examined the evidence available, and, and the evidence comes in many different forms, and it's not, I don't want to suggest that there's, a, you know, a, a body of, um, you know, 3,000 research papers, longitudinal um, data on this. There's not. We had to pull the evidence together from multiple um, multiple places, multiple types of evidence. But ultimately, the committee came together to conclude that the available evidence is sufficient to support um, greater integration in higher education. And, um, and the committee urges that institutions embrace uh, and sustain ongoing integrative efforts, but also in doing so that they evaluate these these programs in order to um, to build on to this evidence evidentiary base. Um, I know today we're really going to focus on implementation, so I wanted to highlight another uh, recommendation, which is that faculty administrators and accrediting bodies need to explore, identify, and mitigate constraints that hinder the implementation of integrative efforts in higher education. We we know that this is not trivial. Um, there's a reason that higher education is as siloed as it is, and so over, overcoming um, the, the very real barriers to any new practice in higher education um, this is not a trivial undertaking. And so today, I know we're going to spend some time thinking about that in the context of implementing um, of the findings and recommendations of this report. Uh, so maybe now we can pause and take any questions on the high-level messages of the report before we move on to this focus on, on the barriers to implementation. Uh, yes, yeah, so we are running short on time, as you mentioned, but one quick question. 
Um, so we move on. We were wondering how did the committee determine which skills are the skills that employers are looking for? Uh, yes, yes. So um, we we have in the second chapter of the report um, an overview of um, several surveys that have been done of employers. So um, so actual actual research on what employers are looking for. I think there are three three or four um, different surveys that all basically arrive at the same conclusion, which is that employers say technical skills are not enough. Students coming out of higher education are lacking the cross, some of the cross-cutting skills and competencies that they need to be successful in the workforce, not only their, for their first job, but for their second job, their third job. Um, so it was really uh, a reliance on existing survey data. Great. Thank you. And before we move on, uh, we just want to again encourage any of our listeners to enter them, their questions in the chat box. If we don't get to it immediately, we will get to it later at a question stopping point in the webinar. So please type in questions at any time. Uh, so. Now we're going to, uh, Ashley is going to move further into that um, recommendation that she mentioned, um, and then after that we'll hear from our institutional examples who are implementing this recommendation. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah, and so I'll, I'll say this recommendation um, focused on overcoming the very real structural barriers to, to integration in higher education. I, I'm so glad we have some time to talk about it today, but I also want to highlight that um, we are, as a second phase of our work, um, we are carrying out an, ag uh, an aggressive and multifaceted dissemination, outreach, and implementation uh, campaign right now for this report. So the f report was just the first step. Now our goal is to talk to all of you. Um, we're doing um, trips to college campuses to, to hold town halls to get input on how to overcome these barriers. So please do stay engaged with us because um, because this is an ongoing effort and it's not going to be easy. Um, but so, so I mentioned there are barriers a barriers to implementing really anything new in higher education, but some specific barriers that um, that face more integrative uh, approaches to teaching and learning include, of course, tenure and promotion criteria, which are often really driven and defined by the disciplinary structure in higher ed. Institutional budget models, which also tend to flow to specific disciplinary departments. Um, the workloads of faculty. Um, accreditation. Um, and I can t talk a little bit more about that, but accreditation, of course, drives practices in teaching in higher education. Uh, and then sources of funding, whether um, it's institutional support for um, for an interpretive effort or, or federal support. Um, so maybe I can elaborate a little bit on, on some of these um, some of these barriers. So it, it, accrediting bodies are an interesting example. Because so this is sort of an external pressure that's put on institutions to to adhere to to certain um, to certain standards and to teach students certain things that need to be included in the curriculum and accrediting bodies are playing an important role in, in terms of ensuring um, you know the quality of of a student's ex education in a particular discipline. Actually, if you look at accrediting the accreditation standards for engineering, for example, you might think at first, well, the accrediting bodies are making it impossible for for integration to occur. If you actually look at the language, um, ABET accreditation actually does ask for for um, for engineering students to be exposed to some cross-cutting um, education in, in other disciplines. And so, as we've engaged in, with with folks on this. Um, this potential barrier, people have basically um, shared with us that the concern is more about how how the um, accreditation standards are implemented uh, on campuses through the, the sort of how they're enforced. But so accreditation is one one pressure that drives um, what students are able to be ex to learn and be exposed to in their um, the course of their educational experience. Um, then. Practices relating to the training, promotion, tenure faculty are, are really a huge barrier. Um, and most of the, I'll talk about this in a moment, but most of the, the institutions that are um, carrying out more integrative uh, models, they have found a way to address um, issues related to um, promotion and tenure, specifically um, providing the positive incentive for faculty to engage in interdisciplinary scholarship and interdisciplinary teaching. Um, if the faculty don't have that incentive, Lord knows they have enough going on trying to make tenure, trying to do their research, trying to, to teach their classes. Adding one extra thing is difficult, and teaching integrative courses is not, not trivial. It takes time to develop these, these classes. It sometimes takes the work of more than one faculty member. And then, of course, budgetary structures. I mean, 
everything, anything you want to do is going to cost money, and if there's no money to do it, then um, then it's very hard for it to be sustained. We found in a lot of instances that programs would be stood up at a university because of a federal grant that was able to support an innovative new teaching practice. Found in other instances institutional grants or institutional buy-in that supports um, that supports innovative efforts. But um, and we also found a lot of faculty that were were basically teaching integrative courses on the side because they cared so much about it and they thought it was so valuable to students that they were willing to squeeze it into their their already very busy lives. So budgetary structures serve as another limitation. I, I will also say physical um, physical and cultural barriers exist as well. We know that faculty in particular departments they spend a lot of time with each other um, and sometimes the you know if you're in the physics department and the humanities or the history department is across campus, you're just not going to interact with those faculty, and, and that can present phys both a physical barrier and a cultural barrier. But we, we, it's easy to get kind of discouraged by all these barriers. There are so many of them. But then as we carried out the, the report, we found so many example programs. And so the report itself documents over 200 example programs integrating the humanities and arts with science, engineering, and medicine. But... Um, but we know that that was just scratching the surface. We don't think that's a comprehensive list. So, so uh, institutions are finding a way to to overcome these barriers. In the report, the committee was reluctant to to say this is like here are the five things that you need to do at your institution to overcome barriers because we have to acknowledge that every institution is different. And so, rather than than say here's what you need to do at your institution, the committee offers uh, a process. Um, that will help institutions to sort of diagnose the constraints on their own campus. And, and this, this process really consists of five major stages, which begins with um, articulating the goals and intended outcomes of an integrative experience. Like, what are we hoping students get out of this experience is the first step. Um, then to assess the institutional context, the specific opportunities, constraints, and assumptions within the, the specific institutional context. Um, and then to identify opportunities where integrative learning could take hold um, it, within the existing curricular framework. Um, then to consider existing best practices at, at your own institution and then also the others that have, um, that are maybe are similar in some ways. Um, and then to use a design process for the successful impl implementation that includes a mix of idea shaping, testing strategies, outcomes assessment, and iteration. I know I'm running out of time, but I'll just say that I'll just offer a few uh, specific examples. We're, I don't offer these examples to say you should do this. You're, these these institutions are are doing better than you are or anything. These are just a few examples that um, our committee highlighted because they're familiar with them. And so we have three three examples of institutions that have adjusted the tenure and promotion criteria to to reward and support interdisciplinary scholarship and teaching. There's University of Michigan, Indiana University of Bloomington, and Rochester Institute of Technology. Um, we also found um, an interesting example in University of Arizona, which has developed graduate interdisciplinary programs. Um, and I could talk a lot about this, but essentially these programs uh, are interesting in that they they actually uh, devote funding, funding from the tuition of students to support the graduate interdisciplinary programs. The way it's structured, um, faculty tenure and promotion criteria are the faculty that are involved in these graduate interdiscipl interdisciplinary programs, they're able to um, support each other in their tenure and promotion uh, process. And, um, and then finally, before I run out of time, um, at Arizona State University, we found another interesting example, um, in which the institution itself has been really restructured around, um, around interdisciplinary themes. Um, the undergraduates, the undergraduate curriculum requires, uh, requires students to um, experience uh, integrative courses. So for instance, the biology, majors, students in the biology major, they, they're required to take two science, technology, and society courses. It's built right in. Because of the way the departments are organized, um, the, you know, the scholarship at the faculty level and the, um, the graduate experiences of the graduate students are, are all very interdisciplinary and integrative in nature and, um, and anchored around grand challenges facing humanity. Um, so, so I know we're short on time, so I'll stop there. But I, I, I just scratched the surface. I welcome your comments, your feedback, your questions um, a little bit later in the uh, program. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Baer. I do see that we have had a couple of questions come in. Um, we need to move on for the sake of time, but uh, hopefully we'll have time to 
uh, address them at the end of the webinar, or if not, you're always welcome to email any of us, and we're happy to discuss offline um, any anything that any questions you may have. Um, so next, I would like to introduce Dr. Jeremy Green at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, where he's the director of the Department of the History of Medicine and the director of the Center for Medical Humanities and Social Medicine. Um, and he will be talking on making space for humanities, arts, and the social sciences in health science education. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, thanks to Dr. Baer and the National Academy of Medicine for for such a such an important report. And and also I want to thank uh, thank to um, Amanda and Teresa as well for helping to put this together. I'm delighted to speak today. I'm the director of the Department of the History of Medicine at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, and this is one of the world's oldest and largest centers for the history of medicine. I'm also the director of the Center for Medical Humanities and Social Medicine. This is a newer venture which connects the medical school, the School of Public Health, the School of Nursing, and the School of Arts and Sciences to promote interdisciplinary collaborations in social and cultural contexts of health, disease, and medicine. And at the same time, being head of these two uh, you know, very different but related organizations helps me to uh, shed a bit of light on some of the opportunities and problems that happen when you think in terms of disciplines. There's things that we can do as a history of medicine department that really crosses between multiple campuses uh, by attending to what history can teach you if you're a physician, if you're a scientist. Um, at the, which is very different than the work that we do with the center, which is to take a number of different disciplinary approaches across the fields of medical humanities, social sciences, and arts, especially as they apply to health sciences education. And this emphasizes the value of different disciplines, uh, history, anthropology, sociology, visual arts, literary analysis, but also immunology, uh, you know, cell biology, uh, you know, epidemiology. Uh, and when they come to look at a common subject together. And in addition to these two ventures, I've also been involved in launching the, um, Johns Hopkins' new undergraduate major, an integrative major in medicine, science, and the humanities. And this is the fastest growing undergraduate concentration now at Johns Hopkins. It's now in its third year, has 87 majors, and we're graduating our first class of 30 seniors this year. And I'm happy to talk more about that in the question and answer. Um, but in the time we have right now, um, I want to talk a bit about the resources and skills that are fostered best within disciplinary centers and the kinds of opportunities that happen at a university, Johns Hopkins, as I think with any other university, the possibilities that can be unlocked by creating spaces and events that connect students in health sciences with faculty in arts, humanities, and social sciences, and vice versa. And the center that we've created, it's an intercampus interdisciplinary initiative. It has three main goals. One is to provide infrastructure for faculty collaboration. The second is to establish interdisciplinary training opportunities on multiple levels. So on the one hand, I mentioned the undergraduate major. Also for graduate students, uh, both doing PhDs in social, social sciences, arts, and humanities, or doing graduate work in, in medicine to find opportunities in, in training together and developing independent studies together. And then finally, to facilitate cross-campus collaborations for impact for ongoing research. And in the time that I have, I'd like to talk a little bit about, um, about I mean, I mentioned here that how, the question, how many cups of coffee does it take to build a program for medical humanities and social sciences, the answer there is, is, is really an infinite amount, I think, especially the place I found at a, at, a, at a university that sees itself as having strengths in both the arts and, arts and sciences and the health sciences, the possibilities for connection keep on multiplying as we go deeper into these rabbit holes. It's quite, quite wonderful for me to be able to catalyze and facilitate these developments. I'll just highlight a, a few examples, which is that there's possibilities that emerge as intersections that can't be predicted in advance. They take shape in new forms of learning and scholarship that emerge, especially in the forms of trainees and faculty that come up with bridges that we don't imagine on our own. I'll give you three examples. Um, here are individuals who have allowed me to use their stories on our website. Uh, the first is Lakshmi Krishna who is a general medicine fellow in the Department of Medicine here at Johns Hopkins. And she pursued a PhD in literature and produced a remarkable thesis that shows that what we think of as the modern detective story, which often borrows physicians, for example, uh, Sherlock Holmes, and what we think of as the, the genre of clinical problem solving, which often borrows from modes of detection and detective story, that these two 
genres required each other. These two ways of knowing came into being at the same time, and a lot actually makes more sense if you think about clinical problem solving and detective fiction together. Um, uh, another example would be uh, Sarah Roth, a doctoral candidate now in the Department of Anthropology, whose work focuses on the ethnography of how living with genetic cancer risk changes experience in bodies and those who test positive for markers like BRCA. And she's gone on to start a medical humanities journal called Tendon across multiple schools here at Johns Hopkins. Um, uh, next to her, we have an image of Sasha White, who is a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Sociology. And his work focuses on how 19th and 20th century racial logics and other legacies of colonial medicine linger in the way we manage international agreements on epidemic control. And uh, Dr. White has become involved in the process of teaching medical students and students at the School of Public Health as well. These are just a few examples of people who I had not met when I began the process of trying to build uh, integrative centers for medical humanities, arts, and social sciences across health sciences. Um, and if this endeavor, if we could move to the next slide, um, really only makes sense as a collective. I'm trying to suggest, the, I've shown you three pictures of three people. Um, if you move to the next slide, our, our collaborations in our center really work because of the people that we are able to pull together and who find a common cause together. Uh, as Dr. Barrow was mentioning, barriers to these efforts can be based on promotional models, economic models for valuing teaching or collaborative work, geographical barriers, and I'd say even more importantly, temporal barriers. But much can be done with relatively meager resources. The key, of course, has been finding the glue that holds us together, that brings people together, and the amounts of time and effort that people are allowed to give to, to um, collaborative projects and integrative projects. I would argue that these connections make visible new forms of training and scholarship that emerge once individuals in different parts of the university overcome that initial activation energy to, to, uh, to, to, to get past these walls that keep us in our own geographical and temporal silos. Happy to talk much more about this in the Q&A. Thank you so much, Dr. Green. This is a really uh, fascinating program. Thank you for telling us more about it. Um, I was wondering, um, since you are uh, well versed in the ethics of research, um, if you know if you know of any of uh, some of the biggest ethical questions in biomedical research today that can be addressed by understanding the history of research and why our PhD medical students and postdocs may want to have that integrated into their into their curriculum. Oh, certainly, uh, and I think that I think that w when we teach uh, research ethics just as a set of, of abstract bullet points. Um, like, or, or, or principles that need to be memorized, it often insulates uh, students from recognizing their own vulnerability to to uh, to, to significant ethical error. Also, also this, I, also it can present the world of of ethics as if they are simply, uh, you know, these sort of abstract principles. So we found that by teaching the history of research ethics, understanding why every rule, like why, we, why you have to have an IRB, why we need to have informed consent, actually derives from a specific set of problems that arose in flesh and blood people like themselves, helps learners both engage much more closely with the social structure that govern the ethics of research, but also understand their own fallibility, that the actors in these stories aren't people who in the past were, 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 were simply terrible, but were simply fallible humans who, so again, it, it urges for a, a more dramatic and a less melodramatic approach to understanding why we need to think about research ethics. Thank you. And um, I'm going to ask you a big question and ask you to answer it very quickly because we uh, need to move on. But we were wondering, um, the biggest challenges that you faced when building the Center for Medical Humanities and Social Medicine, what were the biggest challenges and maybe quickly how you were able to overcome them? Yeah. So again, I think, I think the biggest challenges are um, how do you get people to meet up and have the conversation, um, whether they're researchers or whether they're trainees or whether they're designing educational programs that allows them to understand the value of integration and working collaboratively and transdisciplinarily. Um, there's, and so we have found that we need to be very flexible and understand that you know, most universities, the health science campus, arts and science campus, in two different places. And so overcoming geographical barriers is substantial, but that temporal barriers, the way that we organize the work of a semester or of a week or of a given day varies greatly between fields. So one of the things that we found is it's actually more useful to have fewer um, half-day events or a fewer day-long or two-day-long events than to have a regular hour-long event every week. So we've focused on thinking about timing 
and how to, how to how to find the kind of temporal commitment that people can make and on a calendar that makes sense across a number of different fields. And that's actually, I think, been our most substantial barrier. And this adjustment, I think, has really helped us um, build something robust. Thank you so much. So our next speaker is Dr. Adele Wolfson, who is Professor Emeritus of Chemistry at Wellesley College and who is also a member of the American Society for Biochemistry and Molecular Biology, which is a FASA member society. Dr. Wolfson will be talking on integration of the sciences with humanities and social sciences at the Undergraduate Institute. Um, Dr. Wolfson? Thank you very much. So um, again, thanks for the invitation, and this is a, a really important topic. I think you'll find that um, the undergraduate model may be a useful one for graduate and professional schools. So um, as, as you heard, I'm Adele Wolfson. I'm going to be talking today about a few examples of integrative or interdisciplinary curricula at the undergraduate level. I'm going to use those two terms interchangeably, even though we all know that some interdisciplinary curricula are more integrative than others. Um, as you heard, I'm a biochemist. I just retired from Wellesley College, where I was professor of chemistry. And I also held a number of administrative roles, including um, as academic dean in charge of the curriculum. So this is particularly um, a topic of interest to me. What you see on this first slide is four approaches to interdisciplinary curricula, individual courses, programs of related courses, fully integrated curricula, and faculty reading groups or seminars. And I'll speak um, in more detail about the first two of these. So um, thinking about individual courses, these are clearly the easiest to implement. They're particularly effective, I think, as first-year seminars, since these introduce students to the questions asked and the methods used by various disciplines, and they provide an opportunity to demonstrate how these are connected. I've taught several of these courses. Most recently, I taught one on the science and culture of blood, which I team taught with an anthropologist. As I said earlier, interdisciplinary and integrative are not the same thing at all. And for the most part, this course was not truly integrative, but rather moved back and forth between the two disciplines. But it did provide some intersection, especially when dealing with ethical questions, which seems to be a topic that's coming up a lot today, such as excluding certain groups from blood donation or blood doping in sports. Um, I also include here as an example some of our engineering courses. We don't offer an engineering degree, but we do have a set of courses to set students on a path to a career in engineering. And among these courses are those modeled on the D-Lab at MIT that some of you may be familiar with, or the Engineering for Humanities course at Olin College, both of which place engineering in the social context of the end users and therefore are integrated with the social sciences to a large extent. As far as integrated programs, I want to talk to you a little bit about our program in sustainability. Um, it was created and offered as a collaboration among three colleges, Wellesley, which is a liberal arts institution, Olin, an engineering college, and BAPS in a business school. These three colleges created a consortium that's much bigger than I have time to discuss here. It's a wonderful collaboration. I was its first director. I can say many wonderful things about it. But for now, its marquee program is this Certificate in Sustainability. This is something like a minor or a credential that goes on a student's transcript. It's structured to start with an introductory course, which, de which is designed and taught by a team of faculty from all three colleges. Students then go on to take a set of courses in specific disciplines and then come back together for a capstone course, which is, again, team taught. It's also project-based and involves interactions with the surrounding community. Um, environmental studies, in general, seems more open to this kind of interdisciplinary or in, uh, integrative work. Um, you may or may not be interested from the viewpoint of um, the medical uh, profession as far as uh, environmental studies, but there are obviously other possible areas we talked a lot about food science, for example, which um, could be used to bring in humanities, social sciences, and sciences very easily and within the context of human biology. Um, as I said, I'm not going to talk about fully integrated curricula except to say that in the past we did attempt a first-year program that occupied most of a student's first year. It was very exciting, very ambitious, but also very expensive and met lots of resistance, and it didn't last um, beyond a couple of years. My last suggestion about models is actually one that plays very well on uh, the, the last speaker, to focus on faculty rather than students as your first step. So a faculty reading group or seminar is a way for faculty to learn about one another's interests and expertise and think about interconnections. It's probably a lot easier at a small school than at a big university. But we have formed many groups over the years. Um, one that we formed was to discuss social issues in science, and it brought together philosophers, 
historians and sociologists of science together with scientists and led to both research and teaching collaborations that have lasted um, well beyond the um, lifetime of that group itself. So now we come to the nitty-gritty that you're here to discuss, the benefits and challenges. The benefits are pretty obvious. Um, we live in an interdisciplinary world where boundaries are disappearing and the interesting questions are at the interface. And the more we can help students make those connections, the better. I'll add parenthetically that I published a paper a couple of years ago suggesting that students who study two fields in depth, a science and a non-science, are better at making connections among fields than those students who simply sample from other fields or avoid them altogether. And this has been uh, supported by other researchers and published elsewhere. I would say that there are two types of students who most benefit from this deliberate strategy of integrated curricula at the two ends of the engagement spectrum. There are the science-phobic students for whom the integration with humanities or social science provides an easier on-ramp to the sciences, and those all-science, all-the-time students who don't see the benefits of taking time away from their science courses until they see those connections. So if this is all so good, why doesn't everybody do it? That's what you're here to discuss today. Um, turf in all senses of the word. So who has the credentials and expertise to teach in a given field? For example, if I want to teach about the history of birth control along with the science, someone is going to come along and say that I'm not a trained historian. Um, turf also encompasses some of the other points about FTEs and student enrollments and budgets. There's also a strong feeling, I would say, more perhaps at the undergraduate level than the graduate level, that interdisciplinary work is less rigorous than work within the traditional disciplines. And then for students, if you're going to, you have to decide if a, an integrative course is going to count towards a major in chemistry or biology or biochemistry or whatever. If yes, there's obviously going to be certain material they'll be missing. And if no, then there's no reason for them to take the courses because it just adds time to their overall program. And then finally, I would say that team teaching is the gold standard in interdisciplinary teaching. Ideally, you would have faculty members from both or even all if you have more than two present for all of your classes, participating actively, modeling good student behavior, doing all the reading, et cetera. But that requires treating the course as a full teaching assignment for all faculty members, and that's really expensive. So I know that your discussion today is focused on professional and graduate schools, but I hope that these examples from the undergraduate level are helpful to you. Thank you, Dr. Wilson. Sure. And we have a quick question for you. Mm -hmm. um, what advice do you give on how to translate an undergraduate experience to a graduate research and medical curricula while implementing um, what we've discussed previously? Sorry, so you're talking about uh, translating the research experience or translating the classroom experience? No, the, the combination of both um, using um, the humanities and the sciences. And how do you translate that in an undergraduate experience going to a graduate in research or medical curricula? Well, I would say that um, the, the list of skills that you put in the, in the very first slide, um, which have to do with you know, speaking and, um, and writing skills, uh, critical thinking, um, teamwork, uh, ethical um, understanding, are all things that are gained at the undergraduate level, um, especially in terms of these integrative um, curricula. And those are things that uh, the students bring with great strength to their graduate and professional um, disciplines after that. And in fact, they make up for a lot of specific disciplinary um, lack, to tell you the truth. So if our students have fewer courses in the disciplines, but they come with those other skills, then they're actually much stronger students at the graduate level. They also um, are able to bring questions um, along with them. So I mentioned before um, the study that I did where I looked at students who double majored or majored and minored in, in two very different fields. And we had students who went into medicine who, for example, were women's studies majors um, who, who were bringing along with them questions about the structure of the medical establishment, um, you know, who benefits, who's in power. And those are the kinds of things that I think make for a much stronger experience at the graduate or professional level. Thank you. And there's another question, um, if you can answer it precise, and because of time we have to keep going, but um, what type of careers do you know of that students from your institution have usually pursued after taking some of these interdisciplinary courses? Well, it's the whole range, obviously. Um, but if our students um, are science majors, for example, but they've been able to uh, integrate some of their science major with uh, the other disciplines, which of course is the core of the liberal arts, 
um, they do uh, very frequently go into medicine, very frequently go into scientific research, but they also go into fields such as public health, um, where they're going to be uh, using some of those scientific skills in uh, the service of uh, society. And we are seeing, I would say, more people going into engineering and engineering-related fields and environmental fields. Okay, thank you. Well, that leads to our next slide, which is our poll, which is a live poll. And for the participants, um, after discussing these recommendations, please select which are, are the top three implementation strategies that you think are the most valuable. So please click, because this is a live poll. I'll give you a few seconds to a minute. But the first choice is articulate goals and intended outcomes. Assess institutional context, identify opportunities for integrative learning and curricula, curricular framework, or consider existing best practices, use the design process, use faculty and trainees as a resource, integrate into a single course, or create integrated program. Um, and if you can, in our chat box, please tell us the reason why you have selected the choices in this um, poll. So we'll give it a few more. Thus far, we see that there's a selection. The top three are identify opportunities for integrative learning and curricular framework, as well as articulate goals and intended outcomes, and use faculty and trainees as a resource. So that's OK. Nope. Any more choices? I think those were the top three thus far. OK, let's go for the next one. So our next poll is um, similar, um, except for instead of asking which, which of these um, efforts or these implementation strategies are the most beneficial, we would like to know which top three you find the most challenging. So the, the choices are the same. Um, articulate goals and intended outcomes. Assess institutional context. Identify opportunities for integrative learning and curricular framework. Consider existing best practices, use a design process, use faculty and trainees as a resource, integrate into a single course, or, in or create an integrated program. And we'll give you a few more seconds to make your top three choices of which of these you think would be most challenging. Okay. Looks so far, um, the two, mm, oh. Numbers are changing. Oh, well, here we go. Okay. The two uh, biggest choices are assess institutional context and create an integrated program. Um, I think both fairly, most likely, according to our speakers, pretty essential um, strategies are also probably quite difficult. And it looks like the integrate into a single course um, also considered to be fairly difficult and challenging. All right. Thank you. Uh, so now, uh, we'd like to present two initiatives from our own organizations that support the integration of arts and humanities with STEM, uh, which we encourage our members to participate in. Dr. Teresa Ramirez will be discussing information on FASEB's bioart, scientific image, and video competition. Thanks, Amanda. So FASEB is comprised of 29 scientific member societies, representing over 130,000 researchers from around the world. Our mission is to advance health and well-being by promoting research and education in biological and biomedical sciences through the service to our member societies and collaborative advocacy. So I'm going to give you um, some information pertaining to the FASA BioArt Scientific Image and Video Competition, which FASA initiated its annual BioArt competition back in 2012. Through BioArt competition, FASA aims to share the beauty and breadth a biological research with the public by celebrating the art of science. Those who can participate um, can be investigators, trainees with current or past research funding from a U.S. A, uh, federal agency, as well as members of uh, FACIP societies. The competition start date is July 10th, the submission date is August 30th, and the notification of winners will be made in November 2019. I've also included a website for more details in case you want to search, but the images that were used in these slides were actually taken from the BioArt competition. And if you have any additional questions, feel free to email me. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ramirez. And I now I would like to introduce my colleague at AAMC, Dr. Lisa Howley, who is the Senior Director of Strategic Initiatives and Partnerships in Medical Education. Dr. Howley has worked on disseminating the report since its release with a small group of its authors, and she's also worked to help socialize and share examples of integrated curricula within medical education. And she will be speaking on the AAMC role of arts and on humanities in physician development, from fun to fundamental. Thank you. Uh, yes, this is Lisa Howley. I am an educational psychologist by, tra by training and um, you know, delighted to be able to be a part of this webinar today and share very briefly some of the work that we're doing here at the AAMC. I'm actually a product myself of an integrated curriculum um, and uh, so ha was uh, really delighted to be able to come here uh, about three years ago. Soon after joining, was able to begin work on a new initiative uh, that we refer to as the role of arts and humanities in medical education from fund to fundamental. Our goal with this initiative is to improve the practice education education and well-being of physicians through a, a deeper integration with the humanities and arts and their professional development really across the continuum. So we're focused in this effort not just on medical students, um, but we're also focused on residency education and importantly how our faculty or uh, physician educators are integrating arts, humanities into their own practice and, and of course into their teaching practices as well. Um, this work began, as I said, about three years ago. Uh, we started with a number of focus groups across the country, listening to our members who are the 154 medical schools as well as teaching hospitals um, across uh, the U.S. and Canada. We uh, convened a thought leaders forum in 2017 where we initially explored the role of arts and humanities and tried to really get a sense of this landscape. There has been um, a lot of work going on, a lot of really great work going on in the last um, actually decades and uh, and so we were very interested in trying to get a better sense of what role the AAMC uh, could and should be playing in in that area to help really our support our members and their work to even further integrate the arts and humanities of course about that same time is when this um, a wonderful report was released from the National Academies. And um, thanks in part to that work, we've actually decided to invest even further and, uh, and, and launch a second phase of this initiative, which we just recently launched. We've commissioned a scoping review um, of the scholarship, the, the research that's been done in this space, um, and that will be uh, conducted over the course of this year, 2019. And in a couple months, we're also going to be forming and charging a new um, council, or it's, it's going to be referred to as the Humanities and Arts Integration Council, which will describe the fundamentals of arts and humanities for teaching and learning in medicine. So we're going to be bringing together a very diverse uh, group of, of leaders to really um, consider the recommendations that were made in this report, uh, consider the, the current state of the research and the scholarship, and then um, and help us determine how we can best support our members going forward. There are f a couple ways that we would love to hear from you. I've already I'm, I'm I'm monitoring the questions and some of the comments that you, you all are making now. Um, I'm seeing some nice examples, actually, of how you are integrating the arts and humanities. We would love to hear from you and hear uh, from more of you. So we have one way of doing that, and that's um, by emailing us at artsandhumanities at the AAMC.org. We have a couple of news uh, articles related to this effort, this initiative, that are out now. Uh, one just recently released. It's on our uh, uh, one of our funders' websites, that's the Macy, uh, the Josiah Macy Jr. Foundation, and that was just published on March 4th. And then an earlier one that we put out uh, when we first launched this initiative back in 2017. So there's, uh, provide a couple links for you for both of those news articles if you would like to learn more about our work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Halley. And we have one quick question for you before we, we move on. Um, we were, uh, an audience member is wondering if there are opportunities to participate in the Humanities and Arts Integration Council. Great question. So uh, we are actually, uh, there certainly is a, a potentially an opportunity. If you're interested, please do email us at that email I just mentioned that's on the screen. Um, we are uh, taking nominations or folks who are including self-nomination. So if you're interested, please let us know. Uh, we will be forming that committee over the next uh, two months. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Halley and Dr. 
Ramirez for telling us about um, the initiatives at our organizations. And finally, we'd like to, um, we have only a few minutes left, uh, but we wanted to address some of the chat questions we received earlier in the webinar, um, mainly, mainly directed our, at our three uh, speakers that were um, speaking more about the recommendation. Um, so that's Dr. Ashley Baer, Dr. Jeremy Green, and Dr. Adele Wolfson. Um, first, I wanted to mention that earlier in the webinar, our speaker, Dr. Del Wolf, pointed out a program from AAC and use, um, they have a LEAP initiative that lines up well with some of the skills that Dr. Bear was mentioning earlier in the, uh, in the webinar. So if you're interested in, in learning more about the skills that integrative uh, curricula can help your students learn, uh, perhaps you should look up that initiative, LEAP, L-E-A-P. And then we had um, a question, or more of a comment, um, from a physician faculty member who offers a fourth year medical student elective about the intersection between medicine and the criminal justice system, um, which I think sounds very interesting. We don't have funding for these activities, um, but our, the audience member asked, um, said that their doctorate is in the criminology and brings a different perspective on violence in vulnerable populations. And at the institutional level, our school of medicine has a medical humanities department and quarterly publication of poetry and narrative some students, residency, and faculty. So thank you for sharing what your institution is doing. Um, we really appreciate that. Um, another, uh, another comment from an audience member says that, there, that perhaps at their own institution, a lack of resources to set up a full center may be difficult at this point, but smaller steps, such as identifying opportunities, seem more doable. Um, so thank you, that's great. And then a, oh, a question, will these slides uh, be distributed to attendees? Yes, they will be. You should be able to um, link to them on the links box on your left. Uh, oh, yep, there we go. We got, a, we got an answer to that already. And then um, I wanted to ask a question to our, to our speakers about um, the benefits that they have seen, to all three of our speakers, whoever would like, like to answer, benefits they have seen amongst students and postdocs and other graduates, um, wherever they're coming from, the benefits that they have seen and the, the, the careers that their students are following. Any, any, of our, any of our speakers on the phone like to answer towards that? Oh. I, oh, oh, go ahead. No, you Hi. go ahead. Uh, this is Ashley Bear. I'll just say that um, in the process of writing the report, we, when we spoke to students and, and, um, and early career faculty and postdocs, we were just struck by their the incredible passion that they had for the positive impact of these experiences, just on an emotional level. There was just an incredible, it was almost like a religious fervor <laughs> for this approach. It was, it was, uh, there was great conviction. So, but I'll just leave it there. I think probably the other speakers can speak more to their personal experience mentoring uh, students and trainees. I'll certainly second that. And uh, I, I'll also add, in terms of the questions of what it means to start up something without many resources, I mean, you know, on some level, Johns Hopkins favors a hunting license approach to, to beginning things, such as the center initiative. So a lot of what we're doing is really trying to align, realign um, existing resources. And that's why I mentioned cups of coffee, because on some level, the, these are connections that people have been itching to make but haven't quite had the time or space to do so. And so what we're doing is really just creating that possibility. And I think that actually applies across a number of different areas, especially the two examples in terms of thinking about criminology in healthcare and thinking about how to develop programs, how to take small steps. How do you find the things that will get the people that you already have with you to have a, an excuse to work together and then build it from there? Hi, this is Adele Wilson. I'll just add, speaking about students, that um, these integrative or, um, or interdisciplinary programs can bring in students who would not necessarily think about a career in the sciences to begin with. So um, putting things in a social context really makes a, a huge difference to first-generation students or, or students from underrepresented minorities. Well, we would like to thank all of our speakers for their time and participation and for this great discussion. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for the opportunity. Oh, and if I can say one final word, this is Ashley Bear. Um, we are holding a large public symposium on April 12th at the National Academy building here in D.C., focused very much on the topic of this webinar, and we would love it if you would all attend or tune in on the webcast. Great. Thank you. 
Very good. So thank you. And with that, we have concluded today's program. If you would like to register for the final webinar in this series on April 22nd, titled Sexual Harassment of Women, Climate, Culture, and Consequences in Academic Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, you can click on the link in the links box on the left side of your screen. We'd also appreciate your feedback on today's webinar using the webinar evaluation that pops up on your screen or from the link in the links box. You may access the recorded archive by using the same login information that you used for today's live webinar. On behalf of AAMC and our FASIB collaborator, we would like to thank our speakers and all of today's participants. Have a great afternoon, and you may now disconnect.